Kevin Patrick! Hey man, guys, are we fired up this morning? I said, are we fired up this morning, guys? And then, well, as been mentioned already this morning, happy Super Bowl Sunday, hey man, guys. It's basically an American holiday. I want to say thank you so much uh, for the welcome done by Keanu Better Than Reeves Shaw, as well as the Roxanne. Great job, guys. And uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, Roxanne is a diehard Chiefs fan. And Keanu is a diehard 49ers fan. And if Jesus can get Matthew the tax collector and Simon the zealot to work together, I'm sure we can get Keanu and Roxanne to work together. That was a great welcome. I appreciate the fact that, uh, uh, Roxanne, you mentioned the scripture to make every effort to live in peace and unity. And the church said, I also want to say thank you so much for that communion sharing by Andrea Lambert. That was incredible about perspective. Guys, I have a deep conviction that when things don't go your way, it's at that precise moment that things are going exactly according to God's ways. And they're always better. You guys with me here? And oftentimes it is that perspective and that decision to make it about perspective in the moment makes all the difference. And guys, I pray that this morning we can be inspired uh, by what Andrea had to share and, and really make those hardships, those unexpected turn of events, simply a matter of faith in God's perspective. So thank you so much for that, Andrea. That was great. And lastly, thank you so much, Steve Peterson, for that incredible contribution sharing. Talking about, and, and I wrote this down. Hopefully I don't butcher what you said, Steve. But you said something to the effect of peace is something we achieve in God when we give. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we have such a hard time giving. Even a dollar, even a nickel, even a dime. Because we attach our peace to our money. And guys, that just doesn't work. Like plain and simple. It doesn't matter if you attach uh, peace to $100. It doesn't matter if you attach peace to a quarter. It doesn't matter if you attach peace to your entire life savings. Guys, at the end of the day, only God can give you the peace that you long for. Amen. So again, thank you for that reminder, Steve. That was great. Well, guys, I got a lot to share this morning, so can I share it? Come on. Yeah. Praise God. I sure hope so, because I'm going to anyway. Here we go. Well, today is Super Bowl Sunday, amen? amen. It's the game of the NFL championship. But depending on how you look about it, it's also a day of winners and losers. It's been said, uh, if you're not first, you're last. And that second place is just the first place loser. Guys, the truth is there are winners and there are losers in every sport. You know, guys, I, I will admit I, I'm wearing a, a 49ers jersey, amen. But guys, I, I don't watch I don't watch a lot of sports, okay? I'm gonna I'm gonna put this out there. But I, I, I do enjoy watching the championship sport or the championship game. You guys with me here? There's something about watching the best of the best compete against the best. I don't care if it's curling. I don't care if it's hurdling. Like, you know, when you're watching the Olympics, this happened like during uh, COVID. You know, like you're just sitting there, you got nothing else to do. And then all of a sudden you're like curling. And then during the Olympics, all of a sudden you're just into these people. You're like, go, 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 yeah! Or like bobsledding, like these random things, like synchronized swimming or something. Like it's the fact that it's the best of the best. You with me here? There's an enamor to that. So I do like to watch the NBA Finals. I do like to watch the NHL Stanley Cup. And yes, I do love to eat at the Super Bowl Sunday game, amen. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff though. But, but again, guys, there are winners. And yes, there will be losers. But guys, that's not just in terms of sports. Let's extrapolate that out. Guys, there are winners and there are losers in life. Mm. Now, I'll never forget, uh, one time I had, I had a D time with one of my best friends named Christian Bedoya. And this is while I was a disciple in LA. And, and I love Christian. Some of you guys have heard this story. I love Chris, so I can bash him just a little bit here. And, and my friend Christian Bedoya, he was just going through a rough patch in his discipleship and things just, he just wasn't making the decision to change the things he needed to change. And, and so one day I, I took Chris to have D time at a cemetery. And, I, and I, I didn't plan this, but when we got to the cemetery, I was walking up and I was talking to him about his life and what the fruits of his life will be and where his efforts are going. And I kid you not, as we're walking through the cemetery, there was an open grave Ooh. and it was a double plot. So it went 16 feet down. Oh my gosh. And I told Chris, Chris, we're all going to end up down there. 
What matters is what you do before that point. And it was amazing to see the man he is today. He's an incredible disciple. He's happily married with a kid. Amen. Amen. But guys, the truth is at the end of the day, everybody dies, but not everyone truly lives. One of the things that, that really disturbed my heart is going through that cemetery. And I saw on people's gravestones, and I don't know why this disturbed me so much, but I looked at people's gravestones and there were misspellings. There, there, there were words that were etched wrong. I'm like, for, for the rest of time, people will look at this gravestone as something that nobody cared about. Wow. And, you know, you see things like loving mother, beloved friend, you know, all these interests. Like what would go on your epitaph? What would go on your tombstone? And I'll never forget going through the cemetery and seeing what looked like a missing plot on the ground. But it was just simply overgrown and uncared for. And and, and so I went there just out of respect for the dead. I just uncovered this covered gravestone. And all it said was, Susan Smith, Republican. That's, That's it? Like nobody cared? Nobody knew? All you ever stood for, you were just a Republican? In the cemetery, there are so many unrealized dreams, so many unwritten books, so many unfulfilled promises, many winners, but even more losers. Mm. Let's turn to Luke chapter 21, verse 12. Are you guys with me here? I'll never forget when I was a kid. Um, I'm a hockey player. I love hockey. Uh, I was a center. I was a small kid. I was scrappy. So they put me right in the middle where the puck was dropped. And I would always get the puck. I was super fired up to, to be on the offensive line. But I'll never forget one time as a kid, it was the champ, it was our championship game. And I was so excited because I knew in my heart we were going to win this baby. It was going to be awesome. But as we fight through the game, turns out we lose. And guys, that was probably the biggest failure I ever experienced as a child was going off of the rink, skating off of the rink with the sound system behind me singing, We are the champions. And I'll never forget in the back of my mind hearing as I'm exiting the rink saying no time for losers because we are the champions of the world. Luke chapter 21, winners and losers. Luke 21 verse 12, this is the point a lot of people get uh, uh, this passage mistaken. They think that Jesus is talking about the end of the world. Because, amen, he he talks about at the end of that time. But he's not referring to the end of the world in this passage. He's actually referring to the end of Judaism, which was the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Check this out. Luke chapter 21, verse 12. You guys with me? But before all this, again, Jesus is speaking. But before all this, they will seize you. They will persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and put you in prison. And you will be brought before the kings and the governors. Oh, no, we're in hot water. Everything's going wrong. And all on account of my name. Verse 13. And so you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourself. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents. Oh no, brothers. Oh no, sisters. Oh no, relatives and friends. Everyone will betray you. And they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. Oh my gosh. Guys, why are we Christians? What are we doing? This is insane. But not a hair of your head will perish. Look at this in verse 19. Stand firm. If you just hang on, you just keep going, you persevere, you push through. Stand firm and you will win life. Wow. Whoa. Man, it's one thing to do great on a chemistry test. Man, it's it's another thing to do really uh, well on your your job year-end review. It's another thing to to, to pay off a car, but to win life, to win life, that means that there are people who lose life. They don't win. They don't cross the finish line. They don't fulfill what they're supposed to do. Are you with me? You know, on social media, I I don't know why, but nowadays hashtags are just not a thing anymore. I don't know why. But back in my day, right, we used to do things like hashtag squad goals, right? Hashtag winning. You know, it's like when you uh, uh, go to work and you get in an argument with your boss and it turns out your boss is wrong. You're like, hashtag winning, right? <laughs> you turn in your paper at school and your professor's like, I never got your paper. You're like, no, I turned it in. Turns out your professor actually did get your paper. He just forgot. Hashtag winning. Yeah. Like, we love to win, don't we? Yeah. We don't like to lose, do we? No. See, God wants us to be winners. He wants us to be champions. Christians 
are the champions of life. We are the champions of the world. The title lesson today is We Are the Champions. We are the champions. Again, today we're going to know who's the champion of the NFL. Amen. Amen. At the end of our days, we will see who are the champions, who are the winners of life. Mm. I got three points for us today. What do champions do? Champions win. Point number one is win respect. Point number two is win your brother. And point number three is win the lost. Mm. We are champions. Point number one, win respect. You guys with me? Praise God. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9. 1 Thessalonians, that's a mouthful. 1 Thessalonians. You can't say that one with the lisp. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9. Paul here, it's incredible. Paul is telling the Thessalonian Christians to live their life pleasing to God. And this is what fascinates me. If you look at scriptures in context, what we see is that ultimately Paul is explaining that when we choose to live our life purely, and holy, not only do we please God, but as we're about to see, we gain the respect of outsiders from the church too. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse nine. Check this out. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you. First Thessalonians four nine. About your love for one another, we do not need to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. Pause. I love this. It reminds me of when Jesus talked to Peter. He's like, man, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but your Father in heaven. Like, you guys are so loving, but be even more loving. Man, you Christians, you guys share your faith a lot, but share your faith even more. Man, you guys are so generous but be even more generous. Man, you read the Bible than you've ever read in your life, but read it even more. You guys with me here? See, as disciples, we don't settle. We don't sit still. We're either growing or we're dying. You guys with me here? What happens to flowing water when it stops? It attracts flies. It's been said when there's no motion, there's commotion. Because we have to constantly be going. Yes, we need to be content in our relationship with God, but we should have the ambition. We should have the drive to do more and be more and more. Amen? Amen. Verse 11, make it your ambition. This is fascinating. Make it your ambition to lead a what? What? (laughs) Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life? We'll get to that in a moment. You should mind your own business, right? There it is right there. (laughs) So it says, mind your own business. And work with your hands just as we told you. So that, when I read this, that's how I read it in my head. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest. Why should we mind our own business? Why should we do that? So that your daily life may win the respect of who? Outsiders. And so that you will not be dependent on anybody. This is fascinating, guys. There's a lot to unpack here in this scripture. First thing that sticks out to me is this concept of a quiet life. What is a quiet life? Kevin, you're a really loud dude. That's true. Does that mean you can't be extroverted? Does that mean that you got to be like flat? You can't have a personality? No, that's not what it's saying at all. For those of us who know the context of the Bible, again, Paul is writing to who? The Thessalonians. What happened in Thessalonica in Acts chapter 17? They had a riot. They literally, the, non, the outsiders, formed a mob because they didn't like what Paul was saying. Right. Paul's like, we don't do that. We don't form mobs. They formed a mob to throw Jesus off a cliff. They formed a mob to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. They formed a mob in front of Pilate to crucify Jesus on, Cal- on Calgary. They formed a mob to kill Stephen. They formed a mob in a bunch of cities to kill Paul. Right. Paul's like, we, do, we don't do that. Mm-hmm. We don't form mobs. We choose to live quiet lives. I don't want to hit this too hard, guys, but this is why as disciples, we don't get political in the church. You guys with me here? We don't do this. Why? Because it's not what Jesus did. Guys, at the end of the day, the problem isn't the government. The problem isn't the left. The problem isn't the right. The problem is sin. That's the problem. You want to fix the government? Let me tell you, make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Amen? Amen. You want to fix poverty around the world? Let me tell you, make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Amen? Amen. You want to fix the social structure? Make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Amen? That was Jesus' solution to life. That's what the Bible refers to as a quiet life. Mm. Then he says here to mind your own business. What is he talking about? Working with your hands. Don't be dependent on others. Be self-reliant. Guys, the truth is, and I know each of us 
has people that come to mind when this scripture comes into play. People who use Christianity as a cop out. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm a Christian. I don't really need to work hard. I don't really need to pay off my debts. I don't really need to take care of my house because it's all going to burn anyways. Mm-hmm. It's true, guys. We can't take any of this with us. But Paul's point is like, no, you need to be the hardest working humans uh, in your circle of friends. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 28 that God's people are supposed to be lenders, not borrowers. You need to be a pillar, not a liability in your community, let alone the church. You guys with me here? And then he says, what does this produce? What is the overall bottom line effect? It says at the end of this, uh, verse 12, it says, so that your daily life may win respect of the outsiders. Again, this is not referring to your quiet times, guys. This is not referring to your prayer walks, guys. This is referring to your non-religious secular activities. This is literally saying how you work, how you study for school, how you pay your bills, how you drive your car. Guys, God wants more for you than just fire insurance. You guys with me here? He wants you to be a champion. He wants you to win the respect of outsiders. It's fascinating when you look at Jesus' example of this. In Mark chapter 7, verse 37. You can write this one down or turn there with me. In Mark 7, 37, it's fascinating. The Bible says of Jesus that people were overwhelmed with amazement. Like they, they weren't just amazed. They were overwhelmed with amazement. Like, oh my gosh, Jesus is so amazing. I don't even know what to do about it. It says they were overwhelmed with amazement and said, Jesus has done everything well. Mm. Oh, man. You bet Jesus paid his taxes on time. Mm. You bet Jesus was never late on his rent. You bet Jesus did his homework. You bet Jesus took care of his horse. I was going to say a car. He didn't have a car. (laughs) Jesus took care of his own business. Being a great Christian means you're a great student means you're a great employee. Guys, we should strive to be the top of our class. Why? Because that's taking care of our own business. That wins, it garners, it gains respect from outsiders. I wanna challenge us, those who work full-time jobs, become employee of the month, make that your goal. As Christians, we're great employees, great parents, great spouses. Level up your life. Amen, guys? I'll never forget, uh, as a kid, my dad shared a story with me, and I'll share it with you guys. And he was talking to me, and he was sharing about how in his childhood, he didn't have a lot of good experience with youth ministers. And he said, he's again talking to me, he said, I felt like where I grew up, it was those who couldn't go through school or hold down a job who would apply for the ministry. Mm. Kevin, don't let that be you. Go to college, get a degree, and get a job where you make lots of money. That way, when God does call you into the ministry, then you have something to give up, an example to share. Wow. Wow. Mm, Guys, at the end of the day, we should be winning respect from the outsiders. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of what some people say, that a person can get too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. I want to ask us this morning, do you make Christianity look good to your employer? Do you make Christianity look good to your professors? Do you make Christianity look good to your landlord, to your family, to your friends? That's what this passage is talking about. One of the brothers I really want to lift up is Landon Nathaniel Mumi. Amen. He's in the other room with the children, so I can talk about them all I want. Amen. And I studied the Bible with Landon. I did have the privilege, by God's grace, through the power of the Spirit, to baptize him, and, and it was awesome. But I remember, and Brittany remembers this, when, when Landon was studying the Bible to become a disciple, let's just say his family was a little apprehensive about him coming to church and being a disciple. Mm. The truth is, guys, I learned that non-religious parents, they, they don't care what church you go to. They don't care really what your beliefs are. What do non-religious parents care about? Are you paying your bills? <laughs> is your car working? Are you clean? Do you do the dishes? Are you on top of your schoolwork? You guys with me here? And it was amazing because when Landon was studying the Bible, he got like solid B's and C's. But when he got baptized, I gave him a challenge to get straight A's in school. And by God's grace, Landon got straight A's, amen. Yes, he was a fire-breathing disciple. He also became a better son to his parents. He also became a better sibling to his older brother. He also learned to do the dishes. He learned to speak respectfully to his parents. Even in the eyes of the world, 
they see Landon is a better person now that he is a Christian. Amen. Amen. I also remember Landon shared something. He went to, for the summer, he went up to Phoenix because that's where his family's from, from Scottsdale. And I remember him sharing with me something that the, the Phoenix brothers uh, did for men's midweek on one of the midweeks. And he said that some of the Phoenix brothers uh, who had better style, like a better fashion sense, they literally got up in front of the brothers and gave pointers on how to dress more presentable. And then they called the brothers, get this, they called the brothers to literally make the gospel attractive, that's a Bible verse, and to learn to dress to impress. What was the result? I kid you not, it brought more respect to that church. It literally, think about it, it literally made the disciples look good. You with me here? I want to challenge us to have an ambition in this church to advance your life skills. Make the gospel attractive. Learn to win the respect of outsiders. They may not agree with our way of life, but they will respect it. Amen. Amen. Students, make it your ambition to have straight A's this semester. Period. Amen. Singles professionals, work 40 to 50 hours every single week. Some of us guys, we're in the singles ministry and we only work 20, 30 hours a week. With all the love of the Lord in my heart, what are you guys doing? Make money, guys. Work 40 to 50 hours. Get a better job. Stop working at 7-Eleven and get a career. Work 40 to 50 hours a week and pray for a promotion or a raise. Some of us have been in the same position at work for too long to have not advanced in your job. You guys with me here? Guys, this is not because you're sinful. It's not because you're unrighteous. It's not because you're unloved. God wants you to take care of your business. Amen. Amen. Let's learn to live lives as disciples that are magnetic and appealing to the outside world. Acts 247, the Bible says that the first century church, and sometimes we gloss over this. We gloss over this. Acts 247, I'm going to read it slowly. The Bible says that the first century church enjoyed the favor of all the people. As Christians, God gives us a life That's even enjoyable to watch. You guys with me here? We become people's favorite, favored. We become their favorite sports team. First, they see us. Then they root for us. And then they join us. Because we are the champions and we know how to win respect. Amen, guys? Point number two. Win your brother. Win your brother. Uh, uh, Matthew chapter 18. This is going to be a fun one. Okay. So Matthew chapter 18 Uh, Verse 12. This is commonly known as the church discipline passage. You guys know that one? It's like if your brother sins, go and point out their fault. You know, and if they don't listen to you, then get one or two others along. You guys remember that one? But it's fascinating what we learn when we read biblical concepts in biblical context. This is what I mean. So so oftentimes what we get distracted by are these like little man-made headers in our Bible. For those of us who don't know, the chapters and even the verses were not in the original Bible when it was written. You guys with me here? So it was a scroll, and it just kept going on and on and on. And so do you guys know what came immediately before the church discipline passage? Do you guys know what passage that is? It's the wandering sheep passage. So let's read the church discipline, quote-unquote, passage from the perspective— Andrea, from the perspective of the wandering sheep teaching. This is what I mean. Follow along. Matthew chapter 18, verse 12. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills to go and look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it truly, I tell you, he's happier about the one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have what? You have won them over. This is what fascinates me, guys. The church discipline, quote unquote, passage is not about cutting people off. This isn't punitive. It's not even about disciplining them. It's about winning them, winning people. The irony, if you keep on reading in the church discipline passage, it never once mentions the word discipline or punishment. You guys with me here? It reminds me of this song that some of us may know in the kingdom, You Fight On. You guys know that song, You Fight On? Right? If your brother is doing you wrong, you take it to your brother and God alone. And you say, brother! And you fight on, oh, you fight on. Great job, guys. Great job. Welcome to song practice. 
Guys, we know, we know that in sports we have to fight to win games. Amen? Amen. Your opponent isn't just going to let you win. I'll never forget one of the darkest days in Hetrick history is when my dad and I decided to play Bill and Steve at a game of cornhole. <laughs> let me tell you, I think Jonathan, my son, was embarrassed at how we did. It was pretty rough. And I know Bill, and I know Steve, and one of the things I admire about them is they will never let anyone win. Wow. We got to fight, and so if we win, we've earned our W. Amen, Bill? Amen. It still shakes my bones to this day. <laughs> But guys, we know we have to fight on to win. So why are we surprised when we have to fight to win friendships and brotherhood with each other? We have to fight to make friendships. What's the point? The point is this. Family, don't let any of God's sheep wander from the faith because you didn't fight hard enough to win their friendship. As it says in Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for a time of adversity. And the church said? Amen. I'll never forget, um, uh, I had a conversation once with my dear sister. I love my sister. I adore my sister. I, I just adore my family. But she was going through a rough patch in her life. And she was making decisions, I'll be honest, that she shouldn't have been making. But at this point, she decided, you know, I'm going to turn my life around and I'm going to go back to college. By God's grace, now my sister is an incredible architect, amen. It's amazing. Awesome. But I'll never forget when she called me over the phone, when she actually got accepted into her university and she didn't have a lot of friends. She shared with me how deeply alone she felt. And she said this, Kevin, I knew I had no friends, not because something bad happened and there was no one to help, but because something good happened and I had no one to tell. Wow. Wow. <sighs> Guys, that hits me. I'm her brother. What the goodness was I doing? What busyness did I think was so important that I left my God-given sister alone in the cold like that? I felt terrible when I heard that. But I want to ask you, how can you be a better brother or sister to the disciples in this room? How can you be the best brother? How can you learn to win friendships with brothers and sisters. Some might say, well, bro, I don't have anything in common with that brother. Or, or maybe, man, you know, me and that sister, we just don't match. It's true. Birds of a feather flock together. But the truth is, we have a lot more in common with each other than we even realize. Mm -hmm. We just got to find out what that is. I want to challenge us as a family. Learn to make friends with each other. I'm not saying learn to have friendships. I'm not saying learn to find friendships. Learn to galvanize friendships. Be like God, made in his image, and create friendships out of non-friendship. You guys with me here? Mm -hmm. Think about it. We make a lot of things as human beings. We make breakfast. We make car payments. We make due dates. As Christians, we make disciples. Amen? Amen. We understand none of those things happen accidentally. So, too, with friendships. You know, if you're hungry right now, you might reach into your fridge and happen to find something ready to eat. But most of the time, you have to make food before you enjoy it. So, too, with our brothers and sisters. The friendships God has for you aren't just stumbled upon. You must make them. Amen? As it's been said, he who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. Mm. Family, God does not want you to be lonely as a human being. As it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, pity anyone who falls and has no one to pick them up. Mm -hmm. Again, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. Yeah, let's fight the good fight. Let's run the race. Let us keep the faith. But we must do this together. No one left behind. We must win our brothers to win these battles and be the champions we were born to be. And the church said? Amen. Point number three. Okay. Lastly, win the lost. You guys still with me? Yeah. Win the lost. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Again, I, I love not just what the Bible says. I love how the Holy Spirit chooses to say it. It fascinates me that the passage we're about to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, the fact that the Holy Spirit chose to put this passage exactly where it is. In this part, just to give you a little context, again, 1 Corinthians 9, 19, Paul here is talking about the freedom we have as Christians. He's referring to the freedom he has actually as an apostle. 
Just to let you guys know, the Jews, this was a big deal, guys. The freedom. Why, why is freedom in Christ such a big deal? Do you guys know how the Jews worshipped? There was a lot of rules mm -hmm. to their worship. You guys with me here? Mm -hmm. yeah. You think being a Christian is hard. Man, I think being a Jew was even harder. In the first five books of Moses alone, there are counted out 613 laws to follow. Wow. Now, all of a sudden, God's people become Christians, and now they don't need to worry about not eating this or not touching this or not going here or not talking to them. Are you with me? So now they have all of this freedom, but they don't know what to do with that freedom. That's why Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Like Jesus made Christianity pretty easy compared to Judaism. So in many respects, guys, being a Christian, our daily life is a lot simpler. It's a lot more free. You with me? The point that Paul ultimately makes here, again, in 1 Corinthians 9, the point that he's making is that we should use our freedom, not an excuse to let ourselves go but to go and save the lost. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. Though I'm free and belong to no one, I can do whatever I want to do. But he doesn't do whatever he wants to do. I've made myself a slave to everyone to what? Win as many as possible. He's a champion. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to what? Win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. What the goodness, Paul knew what was up. Paul knew how to win, amen? amen. So you don't win by doing whatever you want to do. Right. There's no such thing as a couch potato champion. Even in the world, in sports, people understand there is a necessity of self-control to reach greatness. It's been said, today I will do what others don't so that I can achieve tomorrow what others can't. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, guys, Paul's like, no, I want to save as many as possible. In verse 23, I do all this for what? The sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Guys, this is a deep teaching. This is a cultural teaching, part of the fabric of Christianity. And we need to understand this as a church. Mm -hmm. Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do something. You guys with me here? Yeah. And some of us, this is what I mean, are thinking it's off. And it's, and it's really hard to show this. Some people ask, do I have to give missions? Do I have to go to Bible talk? I mean, if I don't go to church today, do I have to go? Am I going to go to hell? No. See, the problem is that's the wrong question. The question is not what do I have to do? The question is what would Jesus do? Paul's like, I don't have to do what I'm doing, but I do it. Why? To save as many as possible. See, it's not about the least you can do to benefit yourself. It's about the most you can do to benefit others. See, Paul was willing to do whatever it took to win souls. Why? He tells us in verse 23, he says, because it's a blessing to the gospel. It's a blessing to those who get saved. And he's like, hey, it's a blessing to myself too. What's the point? Everyone wins when we win the lost. Mm. One of my movies, I'm a big movie watcher, right? I know some of us in this church oh. need to repent. We need to watch some more movies, guys. Come on. <laughs> we need to win the respect of outsiders, okay? But there's this movie um, uh, called The Magnificent Seven. And one of the reasons why I like the movie is because it's got Denzel Washington as the main character. I love Denzel Washington, the equalizer. That guy's awesome, right? Amen, Isaiah? That guy's a beast. So it's got De Denzel Washington in it. And, and apparently in the movie, he's a famous U.S. marshal. And there's this widow, this woman, like Emma or something. And her husband gets murdered by the big bad guy. It's like Bartholomew Bar uh, Bogue or something. And so the widowed woman tries to find, and she does, find Sam Cheesum, Denzel Washington, to basically – Pay him whatever she has left so that him and his guys, his friends, can come and kill the bad guys and kick them out. And it's fascinating because there's a scene in the movie that I, I've never forgotten because she has pennies. She has nothing. Again, she's lost everything. And so she comes to Sam Chisum, who's kind of like a big, strong dude, again, police officer, all this stuff. And she offers him just kind of what's in his hand. And, and she simply says, here's everything I have. And Sam Chisum is deeply touched by this. And to the great surprise of his friend, Sam Cheesum takes up the offer to lay his life on the line and take care of the bad guys. You guys with me here? Yeah. And so there's a point uh, at the end of that scene where his friend asks him 
why he took the job. And Sam Cheesum simply replies, I've been offered a lot for my work, but I've never been offered everything. Wow. Wow. Like he saw this was all she had. I want to ask you, how much more is a soul worth to you? How much more time is a soul worth to you? How much more energy is a soul worth to you? How much more, let's be honest, how much more disappointment, how much more pain is just one more soul worth to you? It can be said that salvation may be free, but saving souls will cost you everything. I remember when I was studying the Bible to become a disciple, and and I remember the brothers who bent over backwards just to see me get baptized into Christ. The sleep that they lost because I could only study the Bible at 6 a.m. and 12 midnight. Mm -hmm. The time with their families that they sacrificed. The dates with their girlfriends. The gas money they spent to get to me. The food money that they spent to feed me. The the, 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 uh, the privacy that they uh, rejected to let me in their home. You guys with me here? Mm -hmm. They did everything just to save my soul. Mm -hmm. And I will testify their sacrifice was all worth it. Wow. Now my job, all I got to do is pay it forward. Amen, family? Amen. As a church, whatever it takes, whatever the cost, we must give our all to win the lost. Mm. Family, the challenge is simple. Just do whatever it takes to bring one more soul into God's fold. Be personally fruitful. You be personally fruitful this year. Every disciple makes a disciple this year. Mm. Each one makes just one more look around guys this is cool this is cool you see this group right here our, our house is low-key bursting we got people standing in the back let's give a round of applause people standing back great job guys i'm gonna lay your life down it's amazing to reflect that uh as of right now we are 33 sold out full-blown fire-breathing disciples amen. in god's church amen? amen believe it or not so 33 disciples i counted and i looked at our membership 16 of those disciples were not here one year ago today. Yo, half the church was not here ago one year today. You guys with me here? One year before. Did I say that right? Was not here one year ago. Imagine, imagine all of the new faces we're going to see one year more from today. Wow. You guys with me here? Yeah. Yeah. But we have to seek and win the lost. Mm-hmm. In closing, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Oh, babe. Philippians 3, 13. We got to win respect of outsiders. We have to win our brothers and sisters in the faith. And we have to, yes, bring more souls into God's kingdom and win the lost. But ultimately, it's for one reason and one reason alone. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Oh, Again, the Holy Spirit speaking, uh, speaking to us through the ages. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, Apostle Paul says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And the reason why Paul was such a champion in the faith is because, yes, he did everything he possibly could to save many. Yes, he did everything he possibly could to save the few. But at the end of the day, Paul would have done the exact same thing just to save himself. Wow. It's like, guys, I'm doing this to win my prize. This is about me getting to heaven and bringing as many people with me as possible. Amen. Family, let's not be losers in this life. And I say that soberly. Most lose, which is why Jesus says the path to death is broad. Mm. But the path to life is narrow and oh so few find it. Mm. Family, we are the champions. So let's just act like it. Let's win the respect of the outsiders. Let's win our brothers and sisters and have better relationships with other disciples than we've ever had in our life. And let's win more lost souls for Christ than this church has ever seen. And let's change this world together. I love you.